Welcome to the Faded Spade Podcast with your hosts, Tom Wheaton and Sean McCormick. Welcome back to the Faded Spade Podcast. My name is Tom Wheaton, founder and CEO of Faded Spade, and we are here with a great next guest of 2020. He is a 30-year industry veteran. Some accomplishments of his many, he's opened up the Canterbury Card Room in Minnesota. He has opened up the Win Poker Room in Las Vegas. He is now the Director of Poker Operations at Best Bet, both Jacksonville and Orange Park in Florida, the largest poker entity in Florida, and also the creator of Best Bet Live, a brand new live stream show multiple days a week from Best Bet. Coming at us live from Best Bet, we have Jesse Hollander. Jesse, thanks for joining the Faded Spade podcast. Thanks for having me, Tom. That's quite an introduction. And I join you from our Best Bet Live set. I love it. I mean, you've got the lighting. You know, we were texting before this, right? And you were like, hey, am I going to need a camera for this? I think I saw a couple and I do. I was like, come on, you're telling me the creator of Best Bet Live doesn't have enough cameras lying around? We do. I got eight. I'm surrounded by eight. (laughs) But I don't have any of my production guys in here. So it'd be, uh, you know, I need the brains of the operation to come in here and help me turn on all my cameras. That's two of us. So, look, man, you know the purpose of the Faded Spade podcast. This is to share the business and entrepreneurial and career journeys of those who I would call influencers in the industry, right? Of which hey, I like truly it. are. And, you know, I love that you're coming live from Best Bet. Everybody watching and listening can hear some of the action going on in the background. So it feels like you're actually in the poker room while we're having this conversation. But I want to start out from kind of your roots, Jesse. So how did you wind up getting into the poker industry? And even before that, like, where are you from, man? What, what are some of your roots? Well, so um, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, in high school, I left uh, Albuquerque when I was about 17, 18 years old, moved to Denver, Colorado. I spent a lot of time in Denver. Um, I have a, I went to an art school, I have a degree in photography uh, from the Colorado Institute of Art. And while I was in Denver um, doing a lot of photography work, and, and I've always been interested in um, gambling, going to Vegas ever since I was in, a teenager, I would say I was fortunate, uh, I guess, in this respect. I always looked a little, little older than I was, so it was fairly easy for me to go to Las Vegas and uh, play a little blackjack yeah uh so one day i was uh working for with some friends of mine for a concrete company um part-time in the summer and we got back to the shop and we were going i was going through the newspaper and i saw an ad for a blackjack theater class and i said wow that would be pretty fun to learn how to do a blackjack you know so i called them up and uh signed up right there and went to a blackjack dealing school and the school I went to was in Denver, Colorado, and it, it just happened to have a poker dealing class going on at the same time. And, you know, I'd be in there learning blackjack, and you'd so many hours of just dealing and practicing to nobody, I'd get bored and I'd go sit in on the poker class because they needed people to sit down and play. Mm-hmm. And I really learned a lot. They had a, a phenomenal teacher, um, that poker class, and I think – I don't know if he's still in the industry. His name was Mike Doe. I think he, he ended up running the, the card room at um, Red Rock for okay. a while. I don't even know if he would remember me from that class. That's literally over 30 years ago. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> wow. So but I learned. Okay. Yeah. So you started blackjack, but then kind of transitioned to poker. Correct. I started out. Uh, I went through the blackjack dealing class and I started dealing blackjack in Central City, Colorado at a place called the Glory Hole named okay. after a gold mine. Okay. Um, and I dealt blackjack for about a year. And uh, in that time, I played a lot of poker. And I learned how to deal poker um, and ended up switching from the blackjack to switching from dealing blackjack to, to the poker room. Awesome. Now, did you play poker too? Yes. Yeah, I well, played a lot of poker. Well or not well? <laughs> when you but you know started. what's funny is, as I was learning how to play poker, I was playing limit hold'em, right? Yeah. Uh, there wasn't much for no limit at all back then. So I was playing 4-8 limit hold'em. And I remember going back to the class and telling the, the teacher, I said, yeah, I played last night. 
He said, how'd you do? I said, I lost. Uh, I learned a lot though. I said, I learned that if the board is paired and you have a flush, at some point you have to stop raising. (laughs) (laughs) I'm still trying to learn that. Yeah. And he said, yeah, once that board's paired, you got to be careful for a full house. I said, I learned that one. Got it now. Cost me about six or seven bets. Check call, check call, pot control, right? Right, right. Pot control. Um, that's so funny. So the first time I played was at the Mirage in my, uh, the Mirage in Las Vegas. And my first lesson was never lose all your money in an unraised pot. And I made that mistake twice in the right. same session. Anyway, that's a good, uh, good advice also. Yeah. So it's so funny to see, um, some of those mistakes still made by people who are, who are just starting. It kind of brings me back to that first time I played. I'm sure you see it a lot, you know, at best, right. but every single day. Yeah. Every day. So, all right, so you get your start in the industry, right? You're out West. So what happens right, next? Out West. You kind of transition from blackjack and you get more and more into poker. When did you kind of get into the operational side? So uh, as I went um, into the, as I moved into the poker room in Central City, Colorado, I worked at the Glory Hall. I worked at Bull Whackers, which was in Blackhawk for a little while. Yeah. Um, and then I ended up moving back to Albuquerque I, I worked and played uh, for a long time. I, I worked at Delt Poker at uh, Isleta. Uh, and, and, you know, even before that, actually, in Colorado, um, they had me work the floor a little bit uh, before I left. So I started in the floor fairly, uh, on the floor fairly early. Um, then I just traveled a lot. I was, uh, I, I was young. I was a poker player. I didn't need much money, didn't have any bills, so I traveled around the Southwest, around Colorado, Albuquerque, uh, Southern California, uh, Washington, mostly just uh, visiting friends and playing poker. Yep. I ended up um, working for a while in Southern California at Lake Elsinore, which is a totally, I don't know if you've ever been there or not, but it's a very strange card room. No, everybody I lives. Everybody lives in the motel, and it's kind of like a, uh, it's kind of a cross between um, Hotel California and the Twilight Zone. It was an <laughs> interesting place. So I worked there for about a year and then um, moved to Vegas. So you get to Vegas. Was that the first time you had ever worked in Vegas? Did you travel to Vegas a lot? What was that experience like? You know, um, I had been to Vegas a lot. And when I moved to Vegas, I, I don't think I really moved there for work. I moved there and I just played poker for a while. Yeah. Um, I, I ended up dealing some circuit events, you know, I dealt some random tournaments, uh, like in the, in the early nineties, early mid nineties at the four Queens. Um, I dealt the world series of poker of the year. Scotty wanted in, in oh, wow. 98. I would deal a couple random tournaments in, in Reno. Um, you know, whatever, just random work. I didn't want to work too much because I like to play a lot of poker also. Yeah. I worked on uh, card player cruises oh, yeah. in the 90s and and that's kind of um what happened was I was approached by Deborah Giardina. She says, "Hey, I'm going to open this card room up in Minnesota. Would you like to come work?" Oh, wow. And I said, "Man, I don't know. I go on a cruise about every 3 or 4 months and I don't have a job and I live in Vegas. Everything's pretty good." Well, you know. Yeah. But eventually you know, so that was hard to, uh, it was a difficult decision. But in the end, I said, that's ah, probably a good idea. And 2000, I moved to um, Minnesota, open up Canterbury Park. Wow. All right. So thinking back to that time, let's say there are people out there right now, right? Maybe they're dealing, maybe they're up and coming in their poker career, and they could possibly have that chance to get into operations like you did. Like, what advice would you give those people who are like, do I make this jump from where I'm at now into operations? What advice would you kind of give them on their journeys? Well, here's the, the, the common problem with, with our industry, which is, is not a bad problem. It's just a, it's the way it is, right? You get in this industry, you become a dealer. It's a really good job. Yep. You know, dealing poker is a good job. You make a lot of money. In most places, you have a significant amount of freedoms, you know, especially here. At best bet, our dealers can switch shifts with people. They, they, they don't get turned down for vacation days very often. Yeah. Um, you can take EOs. You know, it, it's, a, it's a good job. And the, but the issue is 
you make so much money dealing, you usually don't make as much money initially when you start to move up the ladder. Yep. Right. And you don't have as much freedoms because you, you got to work a shift, more of a solid 40 hour shift. But my advice would be, unless you just want to deal poker for your entire life, take the opportunity as soon as you can to start moving up the ladder, get on the floor, be a dual rate, uh, whatever it takes, because, you know, a dealer is going to make this much money forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's good. It's a good living. It's a good amount of money. If you decide to move up in the industry, you drop below that line a little bit, but then you go up, right? Yep. Take a so step you, back. You cross to go a line. Yep. Uh, uh, correct. So I would recommend if that's what you want to do to make that move and make that jump as early in your career as possible. I love it. I know there are going to be people watching this that actually are in that situation for a fact because they write us. <laughs> so that's, that's uh, right. listen up guys. If you're watching or listening, listening up, this is somebody who's got 30 years experience in the industry. And if you're thinking about making that jump or have the opportunity to make that jump, yeah, your pay might take a short decrease, but in the long run, it's going to work out for you. So. Right. It's a short decrease in the short term, but, it, but it's in the long term, it's the right thing to do. Also, you know, people say, um, well, I'll make more money dealing than I will as a floor person. However, what normally happens is people who are dealing, they don't work their full 40 hours either. So because of the liberties you have, you end up actually not taking home as much money. You don't get as many benefits um, or vacation time. So move up the ladder, jump on the floor as soon as you can. Got it. All right. So you're in Minnesota or Minnesota, however they say it. Yeah. Minnesota. Minnesota, don't you know? <laughs> <Minnesota. clears throat> That's right. So what was that like for you? So this is so funny because obviously you work with Deb now, right? And I'm sure there's history. Correct. There. So yep. Deb brings you to Minnesota. You're at Canterbury and it's okay. I've got to help open up this room. What was that like for you? You know, it, it was really fun. It was a great experience. And I, I moved out there. I showed up a little bit early, um, I think a month or so before we opened the card room. So I was able to help out a little bit in the initial setup. Uh, and I was uh, employed as a floor person. So not, not a dealer, just a floor person. Um, and, you know, I moved to Minnesota from Vegas. So I went from a place where it gets to be 110 degrees, 115 degrees even in the summer, to Minnesota. And the first year that I was there, it didn't get above zero for two weeks straight. Oh. So that, that was the biggest, um, that was the, 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 the biggest thing to get used to. And there I was driving around in my Cadillac from Vegas, you know, spinning around <laughs> on the snow. Uh, so I did end up having to buy a four wheel drive because the, the Cadillac just couldn't make it. Yeah, no, I, I would think not. So <clears throat> walk us through, all the, the first three or six months of opening a poker room, like what types of things were you responsible for at the time? So um, with Canterbury Park, we almost everything was set up before I got there. They had okay. been in training, the dealers, they had trained the staff, um, the room was built. We had, I think we opened with 30 poker tables and 20 uh, pit games, table games, blackjack and, and, and other games with some, different regulations than, uh, than Vegas. Um, but you know, to, to open a poker room, you, you have to, you have to order all the chips, you have to order all the chairs, the tables, and there's so many little things, you know, dealer buttons, uh, all the other standard buttons, and cards, cards, <laughs> cards. You, need, you need to open with how many cards are you going to need, right? Yeah. How many employees are you going to need? And the, the forecasting, is really difficult. It's kind of a, you got to look into your crystal ball and hope that you're right. Cause you have no idea how much business you're going to have. Right. You know, and when we opened up Canterbury, we had a lot of business. Um, it was a great poker room, a lot of fun. Um, and, and the, you know, the people were nice. It's true. You know, they're nice in Minnesota. The Minnesota nice does carry over. So the people were nice and it was a great experience. How long were you there? I was there for, um, let's see, I'm trying to think, when did Wynn open? I think Wynn opened in 2005, okay. four or five. So I was there for about four or five years. Um, and, you know, it was a great job. And even at the end, I didn't really want to leave. I said, well, this is a great job. 
uh, eventually Deborah Giardino also got, she got the job at Wynn yeah. to be the director of poker operations at Wynn and asked if I would come along there and help her open up Wynn, which was a whole different animal, right? Um, but before I left, the, one of the, the things that was so cool about the job at Canterbury Park is I could play and ah. I could play uh, where I worked and I could play while I was working. So I was the, the greatest prop uh, ever, right? <laughs> I'd, I'd see a list of about four names on the 612. I'd say, all right, guys, we ready? We'd start the 612. As soon as it filled up, I'd get out of the game, start the 816. As soon as that one filled up, go to the 1530. So it was a fun job. Wow, I, I never hear that anymore. I hear the complete opposite where folks just can't play where they work or sometimes at any property associated with where they work. Right, and that's more common now, not being able to play. I, I Currently, I am not allowed to play in Jacksonville at either Best Bet property, so yeah. I, have to, I have to travel to play now. But back then, it was more common for people to, to not only be able to play where they work, but kind of be encouraged to uh, play and help start games and hold games together. All right, so you braved the Minnesota winter for five years, and now all of a sudden this opportunity comes up, and it's, hey, we want you to come to Vegas and open up win poker. And I remember this before I got into this line of business when I was just a player, the excitement around win poker um, coming aboard. I remember yep. the, the kind of energy that Las Vegas was feeling because of it. So – Walk us through that. You get to Vegas, you pack your bags, you unpack your bags, and it's time to open up Win Poker. How is that experience different than Minnesota? So, um, you know, as I decided, I said, you know, I never really wanted to go back to Vegas and work in the industry. I like Vegas and I like to, to play poker in Vegas. I like to be in Vegas, but I didn't really want to work in the industry. And then this opportunity came up and I said, well, I think this is a, an exception. This is something I have to take, right? Yeah working for Steve Wynn and um, so I was excited about it and I moved to Vegas before Wynn was even built um, so Steve Wynn bought the Desert Inn uh, as a wedding gift to his wife at the time Elaine Wynn he bought the Desert Inn and he blew it up and he built uh, Wynn uh, built the first Wynn Casino right um, which originally was supposed to be called La Rev. Hmm. the name of the show but he decided that uh, somebody talked him into it they said no you need your name on there so it was opened up as win anyway when the, the company it's a it's a major corporation mm -hmm. and we were in the in the trailers setting up and everything was very detail oriented we had to build out all this training material and, and really um detail every last piece uh, of what it was going to take to open poker and to order the cards and all those things I talked about and um, and all the training and everybody from every department were, was in these in these trailers so we would all go back and forth to each other and talk to each other about bouncing ideas off or how do you guys do this or they would come and ask us how are we doing that and it was a really um a great experience to be able to start from scratch and you know design all the chips and the tables and, and, and everything from the bottom up it was a great experience what is it like recruiting for that type of operation or even like what, so, i imagine it's one of the biggest parts is recruiting staff right so what what is that like what is that process like for folks who don't know about it so there, there's a, a few things one since we were all in the management team there was, you know, tons of thousands of people coming in and applying to work at Win in some capacity or the other. So we, as management, would have to go out and do the preliminary interviews for pretty much all departments and then pass those along. So they would have to pass that first interview and then they would get a second one. For the poker room specifically, um, we knew a lot of people in the industry. So hiring the, the management really wasn't too difficult uh, okay. because we already knew some people we got the word out and we hired the management but for the dealers we had to hire uh originally we hired a hundred dealers i think 110 dealers what we hired uh to, for the original staff but we did over a thousand auditions so it was literally one in ten 
would uh, would pass the audition. And the audition process was um, was was a big process. We'd schedule everybody. They would come in in groups of uh, nine. They all had to sit and deal and play. We made them play also not to see if they knew how to play poker, but just to, to be able to see their attitude as a person yeah. off the felt kind of. And, and then we'd give them an interview. So they had to deal, they had to play, they had to spend time with us and then have an interview. Um, so anyway, we had, you know, with over a thousand people um, doing auditions, we were able to be very picky about who we hired. That's fantastic. So how long were you at when? I left when in uh, the end of 2010 okay. to come here to Florida, okay, um, Northeast Florida in Jacksonville, and work for Best Bet. And originally, there were two poker rooms here, one in Orange Park and one in St. Johns County. Yep. And then about a year later, we opened up, a year and a half later, we opened up the, the, the what is now the flagship room. Uh, best bet Jacksonville. So this was before Florida poker became, I don't know what the right word is. I don't want to say real poker, but this was, this sounds like this was yes. before 2000, about seven years before when you're able to actually buy in for the same types of amounts as Vegas, California, et cetera. Right. Well, no, it was right after. So in, in July, 2010 is when they lifted the limits okay. off of, um, uh, in, in Florida from, you know, a hundred dollar max oh, buy-in or, or something like that. Why am I thinking 2007? I'm, I'm not flies. sure why I'm thinking 2007. Anyway. Yeah, okay. Got it. So this is right after like they literally right. opened up the buy-in limits. And I don't know how long it took leading up to that because yeah. I think it was a hundred dollar max buy-in at that yes. point. But before that it was $10 maximum pot. <laughs> yes. For years. I played in right? those games. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, ten dollar maximum pot. So, um, you know, the president at the time decided to come sort of recruit us. Deb Giardina came out here, and I followed again. Um, they wanted their idea was okay. We're we're unlimited now. We can be a real poker room, and they want to go out and find people who already had experience in a real poker room. So, they found us. So it's Florida poker. It's right. At the what I'll call the Florida poker boom, I loved yep. that time. I mean, that was the best time for That's poker. In great Florida. time, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I remember Jesse having to play in the underground games around Orlando to play real poker, sure. and then it was like, oh wait a minute, I can drive two hours to Best Bet or forty-five minutes to Daytona or whatever, and right. go play actual Las Vegas style poker, California, New Jersey style poker. It was the best time. So. Okay, so now they're tasking you to say, we want Best Bet to be one of the, the premier poker locations in Florida. What did you learn from Wynn and um, Canterbury that kind of helped you with this kind of big undertaking? Because it was, I'm sure, a pretty big undertaking. It was a huge undertaking um, to, come, to come here basically dark, you know, not really know what yep. was going on. And it's true, Florida as a state was sort of behind the times, right? Not just Best Bet or Daytona or, you know, the Seminoles down south. Everybody was very much about, you know, seven to ten years behind in, in uh, poker. And, and that was evident in the players, the way people played, uh, management styles, dealers, everything. So it was kind of a culture shock. Yeah. Uh, and it was really interesting. You know, I remember playing in a game uh, before I worked here. And everybody was real nice. The players were nice, but they would do things like, um, you know, okay, who's got the heart? Who has the flush? Yeah. <laughs> you know, things that if you see people doing that in Vegas, somebody would come unglued and say, what are you doing? Telling them what they have, you know, and nobody cared. Um, so that was a little bit of a, a culture shock. We had to sort of train not only the staff, but the, the players as well. Um, and then, you know, through having, I guess, a lot of experience uh, of, of my own in, in different markets, um, all through the Southwest and Southern California and Vegas and Minnesota, I, I think it's helped a lot to, yeah. you know, to, to know 
kind of what players expect yep. out of a good poker room. Yep. So this was what, 13? No, 10 years ago. 10 years ago? <clears throat> 10 years ago, I moved here. And about eight years ago, I think we opened up Best Bet Jacksonville, which is yep. the, it's the largest poker room in the state with 70 poker tables. All right. So let's get into Best Bet Jacks, Best Bet Orange Park. But before we do that, one thing that I know is really important to career growth, because you know, before I started Faded Spade a couple of years ago, I was in the corporate world, growing in the corporate world, different types of director, vice president jobs. And one thing that was important to me um, and really important for anybody's career is the support you get from other people, right? Yes. So talk absolutely. to me about the support and the people who kind of helped be mentors to you and help you grow in your career. Well, I will say this, you know, you're, you're only as good as your team, right? Yeah. So uh, I have been fortunate to, to work and here at Best Bet, we have a great team of, of four people, great crew of dealers. Um, and they really are the ones that make me look good, right? Yeah. Um, so, and same thing at Wynn, we had a great staff and, and Canterbury. Um, but as far as, you know, my mentors, I guess the people that I really watched were, uh, the old school guys in, in Vegas. Yeah. Um, when, when I was dealing, uh, God, I can't think of his last name. Tony, uh, at the Rio during the real carnival of poker was just one of those kind of old school guys that yeah. knew everything about everybody. And basically, you know, they, they knew what to, ex they, they knew what the players were, were going to want before the players knew. Yeah. Right. Um, and Jeff, uh, Jeff Vanderlip was a guy who worked with at Canterbury Park. He was a graveyard shift manager and he was an old school Vegas guy also. So I would just, you know, pick his brain every night about little things. You know, what do you do in this situation? What do you do in that situation? Yeah. Um, back then, the, the some of the advice was, uh, don't spend too much money on your suits because you have to clean a lot of ashtrays, <laughs> right. you know, which we don't have that problem anymore because nobody smokes in the poker room. But right. back then you're walking in and out of all the poker rooms. He says 90% of your job is, is, is basic customer service, you know, cleaning ashtrays, making sure people have uh, a drink, making sure they're, they got chips. Yep. You know, even though you're in a suit, you're basically just uh, a well-dressed chip runner, waitress, right. bus boy, everything, right? Right. Yeah. Servant, servant leadership. Absolutely. Yep. And it seems like through this career growth, one of the constant people who you worked with was Deb, right? So, so tell me how that dynamic duo kind of has, you guys have worked together for the last, you know, 25, 30 years. What's 20 that years, yeah. like with Deb? 20 plus years. So it's, it's been a great relationship. And uh, as I said, we, we met on um, card player cruises. So yeah. back in the, in the night, card player still does cruises. Yeah. Um, and it, I, back in the nineties, I was uh, fortunate enough to be hired and go on a couple of the cruises and they liked me. So they kept inviting me back. Um, and every, every cruise had a very similar crew, right? So Deborah, Giardina, and her family were on the boat, and um, uh, a, a, a very similar crew of dealers. And so you meet and made a lot of friends on the cruise. You wouldn't see them again for another three or four months till the next cruise. Yeah. And that's where she said, "Hey, I'm uh, opening up this place in Canterbury. Yeah. Would you like to come work for me?" Yeah. And I thought about it. And I said, oh, "I'll think about it." And then the next cruise happened, and I said, "Okay, fine." Yeah. And then. Um, so she sort of brought me in and, uh, you know, gave me some, some training of her own at Canterbury Park. Also, uh, Jerry Fuller yeah. was at Canterbury Park also. He's now, I think he's moved to Vegas. Um, a wealth of knowledge and just an unbelievable wealth of knowledge. So Deborah had hired Jerry. Uh, and I would sort of pick their brain about everything and you know, learn everything I could. And then when Deb um, decided to take the job at Wynn, she, you know, asked me if I would come along. I said, all right, I couldn't turn it down. And then yeah. the same thing happened for, for Jacksonville. Yeah. So we, we've been a team for uh, over 20 years. Um, 
and we work well together. You know, we don't always agree with everything each other says, and I think that's part of the the thing that keeps us uh, uh, balanced and working well together. Is, right. You know, I don't agree with everything she says. We'll talk it through. She doesn't agree with everything I say, which is um, beneficial. You know, yeah, yeah you be able you, to talk, talk it out and figure out what's right. You make each other better, right? And I think it's so exactly. cool that there's been that story together through now. Now it's 2020. It's best bet. Jacksonville, Orange Park, the largest poker entity in Florida, if that's the right phrase. But, you know, I mean, I've been there a few times, obviously, uh, worked with you and have got to know you over the last couple of years. And I know the poker room is run um, really well, very player centric, um, great games, uh, great service, you name it. So let's talk best bet Jacksonville. So the poker boom in Florida happens. Best bet Jacksonville is now open up and away we go right so what was that time away like? we go that's right <laughs> what was that time like when okay you realize like you were one of the prominent poker rooms in florida florida poker is booming what were some of the things that you said we have to do here at best bet jacksonville to differentiate yourself well i'll tell you what um one thing to go back on what we were just talking about we also have some employees here who have followed us from Minnesota. So we have several floor people and dealers that have worked for myself and Deb for um, o you know over 20 years from Minnesota, followed us to Vegas, and then out here to Florida. So it's been kind of cool having that uh, uh, little you know group of people that have uh, followed us around the country. But to answer your question, so the first thing we did was say, okay, we need to get on the map and we want to be on the map big time. So we contacted world poker tour yep. and said, we want you to do a stop here in uh, Northeast Florida at best bat. Um, and, and then, so we, we did, we had a world poker tour event and, and we played it at orange park, our orange park facility, which came with a lot of challenges. Um, you know, they had to set up their, there at the time, the Royal Flush Group Bar had to be somewhere, and um, we brought in players from all over. We had a, a cash game set up uh, at one point for for it was a fifty thousand dollar buy-in cash game, and that was unheard of here in the state of Florida to have a fifty thousand dollar buy-in cash game. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and it was televised. Kirk Kirk Fowler from Windy City Productions said, I want to do a big cash game. So we said, no problem, we'll set it up. And he came down and filmed it. Um, but we didn't have the chips for that big of a game. You know, so we had to order them with chips. We had to get $5,000 chips because they just didn't exist here because there was no need for them. Mm -hmm. um, but that was the first thing we did is we said, we, wanted, uh, we want World Poker Tour to come to Best Bet. Now they came to our Orange Park facility first and then we scheduled uh, a bigger televised event here in our in our Jacksonville facility, right? Uh, literally a month after we opened. Got it. Well, hey, shout out to the World Poker Tour. As you know, we're the preferred playing cards of the World Poker Tour, and unbelievable right. people all across that organization. Like they are a true family. It, I can't say enough great things about that company and the people. Uh, I, I agree, one hundred percent. It really is the the WPT family, and you know we've been happy to be part of that WPT family ever since, and we still are. So uh, we're still part of the World Poker Tour. And I'll tell you something funny that happened when we first opened up um, Best Bet Jacksonville. And we, we had to get prepared for the WPT, which was gonna be here a month after we opened. So I said, all right, we need to test the facility, not just ourselves, um, but the room, right? What happens when we fill 70 poker tables? <laughs> and so we, we put together a tournament. It was a, a $10,000 added tournament and it was a low buy-in, like $50, I think. And we filled every seat in the house. Um, and then something happened. So we're testing our, our, ourselves, right? Can we handle all 70 tables going? Can the can the, uh, the food and beverage handle it? Can the you know security, the lighting, and you know what happened? Everybody goes on break. Uh, all of a sudden, people are saying, "Hey, the water's not working anymore." Oh, I said, what no. do you mean? I said, "There's no water in the bathrooms. The toilets aren't flushing." 
what happened was everybody went on break at once and the, the, the restrooms couldn't handle that much use. So all the water was gone. And then about, you know, 20 minutes later, everything was back to normal. <laughs> But it was a, a panic for a second, like, wow, the water's off. What's going on? You're like, I didn't sign up for this. I'm a poker room operator. I don't, I, right. come, come on, right? Well, I'm glad yeah, I don't know how to on. fix the toilets. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad right. came but back you, on. You never know what's going to happen, you know, so you sort of have to test the, the, whole, the whole place. And, and now the flagship tournament you guys have is the WPT yep. Best Bet Bounty Scramble. Am I right? That's correct. That's and correct. That is still on my list to play. Um, I'm sorry I haven't played it yet, but this year will definitely be the first year we play it. I've heard unbelievable things about that tournament. And I would say from a player perspective, not just a business perspective, you know, if you have a chance to get to Florida for the World Poker Tour Best Bet Bounty Scramble, I'm going to be playing this year. A number of other people that I know are going to play for the first time here. I hear it is one of the most fun, yet challenging, um, yet also just creative tournaments that WPT offers. So I would encourage people to come on down to best bet and, and play in that tournament. And when does that happen this year? It'll be in, um, it'll be in October. October right. the, the, the series will be October 2nd through 20th. And the main event will be October 16th through the 20th. Okay. And it really is a fun tournament, you know, and it's a $5,000 buy-in, which is big, right? That's a lot of money for people to buy in, especially uh, in our market, you know, we have a lot of tournament players here, a lot of good tournament players, but 5,000 is a little bit steep. So we have a very aggressive um, satellite program, uh, which puts about at least 100 players of our local players in the tournament through satellites leading up to the main event. Okay. So we, we try to do that. You know, we want the event to be to get a lot of players, but we want all our local players to have an opportunity to play with the with the big shooters and for the big money. So there you go. You got to balance both. And I love the fact That's that you right. guys are doing that. So, all right. So, you know, I want to hear kind of what you have coming up um, at best bet Jackson, orange park, maybe March, April, may give you a chance to talk about that. Then get into best bet live, which I think, I think our viewers and listeners would really like to hear the story about that. Right here. Um, and then, you know, we'll wrap up with just some parting advice to, to folks who are on that poker operational path, but, what do you guys sure. have coming up now, Jesse, in terms of uh, March, April, May at Best Bet Jackson, Orange Park? Well, coming up uh, in the near future is the WPT Deep Stack. So World Poker Tour Deep Stack Series will be in March the 20th through the 30th. That's always a fun series. Um, it's a, a, the WPT, sort of a more of a regional event, not necessarily the, the big tour event. But it's a good event. It's a good series, um, and we always draw a, a big crowd for that as well. That's, so that's coming up in March. We always have lots of high hand promotions. Um, you can find everything on our website, which is Best Bet Jacks. That's Best Bet J A X dot com. Um, lots of high hand promotions. We have a, a fifty thousand dollar drawing in March. It'll be both rooms combined. Um, we also have thirty thousand dollar. Uh, no Limit Hold'em, Bad Beat. There's also Bad Beats in Omaha and Stud. The Stud actually just got hit the other day. Oh, nice. Uh, for, for about 15000 Um, Yeah, and tons of cash games. I mean, we do have we, – we have one thing that I think um, our players are very spoiled with. We have so many tables and so many games that if you travel around the country and you go to a poker room and you want to play – you know, frequently you have to wait on the list. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that wait can be a um, pretty long time, you know. Mm -hmm. We're very fortunate here is once we get enough players, we just open up another game. So either you get in a game or we open up a game, the average wait time is less than 10 minutes, which wow. is really amazing. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's great to hear. And you know what? I think uh, I wrote down the dates for WPTDS. I think I might try to come and play in that main event. And, I think uh, you should come play in the main event. See if we can't bank one and earn some cash towards the Best Bet Bounty Scramble, right? So That's a good idea. All right. So let's talk Best Bet Live. This is an area that I know you and I are both really passionate about. This is about yep. poker live streaming, poker entertainment, putting Florida poker on the map, putting players from the region on the map, and just broadening poker throughout all the streaming platforms there are now. I know we've talked about this. I believe that this type of poker entertainment – and streaming is critical 
for poker's future. Um, I think it's one of the biggest new player acquisition type initiatives a poker room can offer, but I know it's also very complicated and expensive to do, right? Um, but you True. and Best Bet made that commitment to get it done with Best Bet uh, Live. So talk to us about Best Bet Live, how the whole idea came to fruition and getting that entire program started. So we, we had the idea for several years, myself and my friend, uh, Johnny Pham, who no longer works with us anymore. He decided to take some time off and travel the, travel the world. So good for him. Um, yeah, it's good for him. He's, he's still young and has that opportunity. So you'll see him around, uh, poker events, I'm sure. Um, but so we had this idea and we talked about it for several years and finally I got the approval to, to go ahead and, and, Let's try it out, right? Here's some, you know, a budget, although it wasn't very big. And I called another friend of mine, who's Kirk, uh, Kirk Fala, who runs Windy City Productions, uh, Windy City Poker Championship out of Chicago. And he had been here in the past to film that cash game along with the a Chad Brown event that we did in 2011. Mm -hmm. And he came out and I remember telling him, because I'm a poker person, not a production guy, right? So I didn't know anything about it. I said, I said, Kirk, I'm gonna need to know every last cable to purchase because I don't have a clue. So I need every nut and bolt and cable and light. Anyway, so he made this big list. We ordered the parts, we set it up. I had uh, our guys here built the table. Our very fortunate also, our, our maintenance crew is incredibly handy. We build all our own tables. All the end tables are built uh, by us. And we built this table, um, set up the lights and the cameras. And originally we had tripods everywhere, and cords running everywhere. Uh, and, and our production room was close by. But it looked like a temporary set. Mm -hmm. And we were able to run it pretty good. We, we ran a high roller. We ran some other stuff. Uh, and then we realized, hey, this is pretty cool. And as you said, it's, it, it really is, um, you know, it's a marketing tool for us. We want everybody to see it, uh, to see Best Bet, to see Best Bet Live. And we run um, all kinds of games. We run 2-2 two -two games, 2-5, uh, Omaha, PLO. 5, 10, 25, 25, 50, as well as final tables of tournaments and even charity events. So everybody can have an opportunity to watch themselves play on, on TV. Um, so we decided we liked it and they gave me more money. And then we built, excuse me, built the whole uh, trust system. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see it. Wow, look at that. Little, little preview there. Yeah. Not sure if you can see the trust, but anyway. No, we got it, yeah. Um, and what that did is that removed all the tripods, all the cords, and everything. So now it looks like a professional studio. Yeah, last time I was there, it looks like a poker studio set. Like, it is very well done. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. And we're, it was basically uh, uh, mine and Johnny's creation. Yeah. So we created it. Um, Johnny is much more of an IT guy than I am, so he was very valuable in that respect. And it's been a learning process ever since. You know, yeah. There's always something new to learn. Um, and I don't have the time to, to dedicate all of my time to the best bet live, unfortunately, because I have two poker rooms to run. Yeah. Um, so there's always something, you know, as you know. And it's been... Um, it's been a lot of fun and, yeah. and I think we have a good product um, and it's constantly getting better. Yeah. I think the production quality is phenomenal. You know, when you think about the poker live stream um, landscape, you know, you can really count on one hand how many are really notable. Right. And most right. of those are on the West coast. Right. I kind of view this as like, this is the dominant East coast, obviously Florida, live stream where people can actually tune in and see what Florida poker playing is all about. And I would put Florida poker players against any of the best in any other part of the country, period. But our market is not necessarily as known as California or Nevada or et cetera. So was that also part of your passion for doing this to kind of put Florida poker on the map a little bit and show off 
what we got? Absolutely. You know, um, and what you said is correct. If you look at the results for the World Series of Poker or, or some of the WPT events, you really will notice a lot, especially over the past decade, a ton of Florida poker players, you know, from the Jason Mercier's to John Raisner's and uh, Michael Mizrahi, the grinder, right? All these guys are Florida poker players. Um, and there's, there's the list goes on and on. And we did, we are the, probably the, I mean, we are the only live stream on the East coast and you're right. You can count. Um, we have a, a live at the bike, obviously who's been doing it longer than anybody. They got a great show. They get, I mean, they're California and LA, right? So they get crazy games. Right. Um, and then you have some of the traveling ones, you know, the poker after dark, I think might still be around a little bit or the, uh, What's it called? Um, Poker oh Night God, in America. Like, Poker Night in America. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and, and then there's the tournaments. Yeah. But as far as just live stream cash games, there's there's not a lot out there. And it, it truly was to get to keep Florida on the map. Um, and it's you know from a training perspective, watching a live stream cash game is extremely beneficial if you oh, want to yeah. learn how to play poker. And we have one of the only places where you have the opportunity. You can come here and play and then go home and watch it later on Yeah, and see how you did. Yeah, I love it. Where can people tune in to watch Best Bet Live? So we're, we currently broadcast in three different spots on our Facebook page, Best Bet Jacksonville, on Twitch, um, Best Bet Live on Twitch, and our YouTube channel, uh, which is also Best Bet Live. And you can always go look at the archived footage. Twitch is a little bit weird. You know, they keep things up for like a week or so. Um, or it falls off as you add new videos. But all of our archive footage is on our YouTube channel at Best Bet Live. Here's what I want to do, Jesse. This is just off the cuff. We'll see if this makes it into the podcast. But here's what I want to do. I want to create the Faded Spade Best Bet Live Florida versus California Challenge. And I want to get the top poker players in Florida to come do a cash game. We'll invite a few from California and let's have a good old fashioned Florida versus California cash game or sit and go or something. But I, I, like I believe that we got to put Florida poker on the map and we will take on any state out there in terms of, uh, we will take on any state out there in terms of the best damn players in the country. I think it's a great idea. I like <laughs> it. And we do have some great players here. If you watch our, uh, our five, 10 and a quarter games or, our 25, 50 games, there are some phenomenal poker players uh, in Florida. And, I, I mean, I like watching the live stream. I like watching them play. I commentate sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes we, we now have an ability to do a remote commentator, so we're going to be bringing in some other people. Um, but I like it, Florida versus California. Let's go. The gauntlet has been set. You'll hear more from us That's soon. That's right. <laughs> All right. That's right. All right, so, Jesse, so – uh, again, you know, really enjoyed you taking time to, to come on here and, and tell your career story and give some advice to those who are on the same poker path to share a lot about Best Bet Jacks and Best Bet Live. So as we kind of wrap this thing up, Jesse, what is one piece of advice that you would truly give anybody on that poker operational path that wants to grow in their career that, you know, maybe they're in their second or third year in the industry and they want to be where you're at? you know, 25, 30 years later, what kind of advice would you impart on those people? Well, you know, probably, you know, pay, pay attention, be observant, ask a lot of questions. Um, you know, I was very uh, interested, you know, I've always been very interested and I would, you know, if you want to move up, you have to, you want to learn what the people above, you know, so you have to ask them questions, right? They're not just going to start telling you everything. So right. ask a lot of questions and, um, understand that it really is 90% service, right? We're a service industry. So you guys got to make people feel good about coming in, feel good about playing and um, make them want to come back every day. So, um, you know, ask a lot of questions, understand that most of what you do is the basic nominal tasks, right? You're seating players, you're saying hi to people, you're emptying, cleaning off tables, trays, you know, you're not, you can't be above anything. Yeah. Um, that's it. That. You know, stay, pay attention, ask a lot of questions and be involved. I love that. And then you'll get to the point where you're managing million dollar budgets and 
national right. global live streams. So um, Jesse, where can people follow you on social media? I'm, uh, I, I am on Twitter, okay. um, J man poker King. You can follow me there. I'm not incredibly active on Twitter, but I do get on there sometimes, but feel free to follow me. J man poker King on Twitter. Um, that's about it. All right. Cool, man. For my personal social media. Yeah. And, and Hey, I like, that. I'm going to be calling you J man poker King next time I see you. So, you know, it's uh, it's an old, uh, sort of nickname back in, when I was living in Vegas in the early nineties, I went, I, I bought a computer and with this computer, you received an hour class on the internet. Um, so I went, I took that hour class and in that class, you had to sign up for a Yahoo email address. And I kept typing things in and they wouldn't take it, wouldn't take it, wouldn't take it. J man, poker King stuck. And the, kind of been there ever since there it is and you know what i had a note down i don't want to forget before we wrap up jesse then obviously i'll, I'll give you some time to do any uh type of kind of closing comments but um you and your wife and as a married man i understand how important this is you and your wife work together and i forgot you have a radio show together right that's, so that's tell right everybody about that <laughs> and tell everybody about ali and uh the things you guys do together at best bet so um Yes, Allie is the, she hosts the radio show, and it's the Best Bet Poker Show. Yeah. Um, it's every Wednesday night from 6 to 7 on our local sports station, which is uh, 1010 XL AM or 92.5 FM. We also do broadcast live on Twitch and Facebook. Um, it's a lot of fun. I've been doing, I can't even, so when I first moved here, the, the guy said, hey, we got this radio show, maybe you should come on. And I was really nervous and I got on the show, I was taking notes and, and as it turns out, it's just like everybody sitting around a poker table talking poker and uh, it is a blast. And it's Allie's show, my wife. Um, so she basically drives the bus and myself and now Dustin, uh, he, he produces the, the Twitch portion of it. And um, it's just a great show. It's, it's all things poker. We talk about uh, news, notes, tips, happenings uh, every Wednesday night. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. And Allie also is a part, uh, she works for herself, but she does a lot of the uh, PR work and commercials and radio spots, TV spots for us here at Best Bet. Um, so it is cool getting to work with um, your wife, but not be in the same office. I so understand. We, we, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> we're together, but we're not always working with each other every second of the day. The poker king and queen of Florida. All right. And right. speaking of Florida, Jesse, where do you see Florida poker going from here, especially with all the latest law changes with the Greyhound racing and et cetera? You know, where do you see Florida poker going from here? Or where would you like to see it go from here? Well, um, I think what's going to happen is, as you know or may not know, we, we will lose the dog racing by the end of next year. Yeah. Um, so there'll be no more dog racing in the state of Florida after the end of, well, this year, 2020. Um, however, the, the landscape for poker has constantly uh, been on an uptick in the entire state, you know, from, from everybody down south. Central Florida, even us, the, the, the tournament entries have increased, the, the cash game have increased. And I, I think that that's going to be, uh, it's going to continue. There's not going to be a big event like the, the poker boom. You know, we're not going to get legalized uh, online gaming anytime soon, online poker. We're not going to get sports betting anytime soon in the state of Florida. But I see the, the overall poker business continue continuing to do a, a steady ascent all right got it good so, you know, me so too it'll continue to grow me too i uh have a weird feeling faded spade is going to be a part of that in some way shape or form as we expand our business operations too yep. but jesse it has been an absolute pleasure getting to know you personally and professionally you know i know we'll be seeing each other somewhat frequently over the next few months as i visit best bet uh, to play and to do a few other business things. 
But, man, I want to thank you for taking time to do this. Um, you know, I want to thank you for everything you do from a poker industry uh, influencer standpoint to try and move the industry forward and to bring Florida poker and put Florida poker on the map um, in the same type of light as California and Nevada. And most importantly, thanks for joining the Fade at Spade podcast, man. No doubt in my mind that, you know, the people who watch or listen to this will get a lot of value out of it. Well, that's great, Tom. Thanks for having me. Uh, anytime. It's great. Uh, it's great to be here talking with you, talking about all things about poker. And we do love the Fade at Spade cards, by the way. We use them on our, on our live stream table. And um, they, look, they look great. So it's a, it's a great addition to our live stream, having the Fade at Spade brand cards. I appreciate the plug, brother. So with that, we will wrap up this episode of the Fade at Spade podcast with Jesse Hollander, Director of Poker Operations at Best Bet Jacksonville and Orange Park. And we will see you on the next Faded Spade podcast. Thanks, Tom. See you next time.